Toronto just got some pretty devastating news that camps for our kids are closed for the summer. Now, this is really difficult for probably most parents to stomach because not only have we been getting our butts schooled by homeschooling, now we don't have the hope and the outlet for kids to be able to go off to camp. You know, and I guess there's two sides. Camp is such a beautiful environment for our kids to go to and to learn some life skills different than in school, right? Socialize differently, play differently, take physical risk, learn physical literacy by climbing on structures, doing things that they've never probably done before. And then there's the other side that parents are grieving their lives, right? Because even though life after being single and now having children is vastly different than it was, life after COVID of being isolated with our kids all the time is really overwhelming, right? And now with not the hope and the light at the end of the tunnel to alleviate some of this stress, it is overwhelming for many. And I wanted to talk about this today because I just saw this post today and wanted to kind of interrupt the podcast we were going to release today for this conversation. And maybe ask the question of, in uncertain times, can we ask different questions than before? Yes, of course, we always want to go back to what we've always done. That is comfortable and we can live into that space of certainty and knowing what to expect. But with unprecedented times come different questions, different skills, different opportunities. So, and I'm kind of asking these questions to myself, also being in shock that my kids are not going to be going to overnight camp. It was gonna be my son's first summer to try a week of overnight camp. Um, and camp will look very different if any day camps open at all. I don't know if they will, right? Um, and I guess, you know, maybe the question is, can we reshift the way that we're looking at playtime, summertime with our kids? You know, I was mentioning it to a girlfriend the other day. When we go on vacation with our kids, it is this beautiful free-for-all of free play and, you know, overflowing of excitedness and joy and happiness, right? And if you look at it, the context of what vacation time is, it is this being present, all immersed time with our families or loved ones or partners or friends, right? And so I wonder if we can take what we know of vacation time and take that and put it into our daily lives come summertime, even come now, right? Can we be ultra present in these moments? Can we create that fun loving space with our kids that we've never really had to in the summer. Can we take what we do on cottage weekends away with friends or family or at your own cottage and put that into our day-to-day? -day? For example, for me, even though this is a lot of work and effort on my part, we've decided we're going to build a tree house. You know, I shake my head while I'm even saying this because I feel like it's going to be labor intensive, really um, time consuming, and really have to make me work my brain and learn different skills that I haven't had to use in 20 plus years, right? Um, but the outlook I'm trying to take on it is that there's an opportunity for my kids to learn and to really do this fun activity, right? Um, building a tree house is a pretty epic project that I can do with my kids, right? I mean, my parents never did anything like that with me, but if you remember back to maybe days that you went to camp, days that it was either summer camp, day camp, Overnight camp. I mean, I never personally went to overnight camp, but I remember I was in, I don't even remember the name of the camp, but 
we would do these things. We would do fort building. Actually, let me talk about grade eight. Grade eight, we went to pioneer camp. Literally, it was like a week away with all my peers in school and the gifted program I was in. And we went away to pioneer camp. And at pioneer camp, we had this opportunity to go out in the freezing cold and kind of learn survival skills um, for outdoor climates. And one of the things that I distinctly remember us having to do is create a shelter out of the things that you would find in nature. So literally it was us finding big sticks so that we could create shelter, protect us from the outside world in the cold and sticks to be able to insulate us from the ground cold, right? So that potentially if you needed to get out of the cold and we're stuck in the middle of the woods, right? Like the pioneers used to have to do that you would have to create a structure that would be sustainable for you in your life. It's kind of like this, right? And I always think that, you know, if I was ever caught in that situation from what I learned in grade seven or eight or whatever that was, that I could go back to that and hopefully survive, God forbid. Um, but it's kind of like that, shifting what opportunities lie in front of us, right? And I also think from a mental health perspective, this is a really important practice to look at what opportunities do we have that will allow us to build resiliency and also to show our children that, okay, things are changing yet again, right? And that we don't have to go into the sheer panic mode. But with that being said, I think it's also like I've been talking about for the last eight weeks on this podcast about COVID how do we allow ourselves to be gentle with ourselves in a space of self-compassion and self-love and recognizing that this time is unlike any other and that, yes, there is some grief around this. Yes, there is some mourning. And in the morning, I think we need to remember that we can't go into catastrophic thinking. We have to look at what is. Our kids miss a summer at summer camp. It doesn't mean that their entire life is going to get derailed with socialization, with opportunity, with connection, with, with self-growth, with um, all the things that come with camp, right? It's really about saying, okay, we need to shift for a moment, hopefully not forever, right? But what can we do in place of that so that it can be fun? right? I mean, I know for me, <laughs> a couple years ago, don't judge, a couple years ago, this is probably about four years ago, no, maybe longer, five, six years, five years ago, we thought we got a 10-year um, passport for my son when he was born. But when we were leaving for a family vacation at Christmas time, we literally, right before we board the plane, I mean, they check your ID when you check in, they check your ID when you go through security. And the last check is they check your ID before you board the plane. And they literally looked at it and said to me, ma'am, do you know his passport's expired? And I was like, what do you mean? I had a newborn, Sloan was a newborn, my daughter who's six was a newborn at the time. And I was like, what do you mean? It's a 10-year passport. She goes, no, ma'am, it's actually only a three-year or something that it was at the time. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, we can't get on the plane. She goes, I can't let you on the plane. And I remember being so upset, right? Because of the opportunity of us being together as a family. So like I board the plane with my daughter Sloan and my husband stayed back with Peyton. And I remember, and you know, Jordan is so much better at me at being present for what is. You know, I was going through, oh my God, we're not together at family, as a family and all these things he's going to miss. He was three at the time or four maybe. But Jordan took it as, okay, great. What opportunities do we have now? It was a staycation now. They had to wait. It was, this was on a Sunday, Saturday. We were boarding on a Saturday. Offices for passports aren't, don't open till Monday. By the time we got a rush delivery, it might have been Monday night. They wouldn't be able to board till Tuesday, Wednesday. They didn't end up leaving till I think Thursday morning. But for those five days, they had a blast. They went out for dinners. They stayed up late. They did movie nights. I think they even watched a Raptor game together. Go Raptors, go, right? And they had an incredible time. 
So I really think that this is an opportunity to look at if we are still social distancing and things are still shut down during the summer, how can we create an incredible new enlightening experience for our children, not only for our children, but for us? What could it look like? I mean, I've never really had a desire to go camping in a national park, but how cool would it be if leading up to June, July, when it's warm enough, that we researched a close national park that would be really pretty adventurous of us to go and camp in a national park. But like, what could that look like? You could even replicate that in your backyard, camp out for a weekend right? Like maybe there are different opportunities for us to say, this isn't it. That there is silver lining, light at the end of the tunnel, right? And going back to the morning piece, yes, there is going to be some grief around this. But if we keep present to what is, and this is not going to ruin our children's lives, this is not going to ruin our lives, what can you do as a baby step, one foot in front of the other to say, okay, what can we do to figure this out? What can I do to make this summer great? Because the only option isn't camp option. There are, I would beg to gander, probably thousands of options ahead of that one, right? Anyways, I wanted to share that with you. And I want you to join us later this week as I sat down with Randy Taran, who is the founder of projecthappiness.org and is also the executive producer of the happiness film. And I think that even though maybe the quotient of happiness isn't this even playing field right now, It's an opportunity to put into your psyche, into your consciousness, things that are positive, things that are exciting, right? And, you know, it's such a beautiful story that Randy shared with me that she created this movie because her daughter was really struggling with, she didn't know how to be happy. So Randy, in all her wisdom, as super mom as she is, decided to travel around the world and go to kids in villages where they really have nothing not a lot, and see what is the essence of happiness for them. And it was really about creating the experiences with what you have, right? And it gave not only her daughter a glimpse into what is possible, but she shared that movie with the world to give everyone a glimpse of what is possible when you take with with what you have and put that, insert that into the experiences of your life as the foundation that you can catapult joy experience, happiness experience, excitedness experience from a place of curiosity and wonder and awe. Like that first time that our kids, you know, ran through grass, first time that our kids saw snow, you know, I really invite you to take a different, a shifted perspective on this time. And I would love to hear from you right? Like how can we maybe do this together? I mean, we, we have these conversations in the Body Project Insider of like, how can we reimagine, reinvent? How can we live our highest version, right? Your optimal fitness is also looking at your optimal life and the facets of like, what can we do? And, you know, a lot of us are functioning suboptimally here right now and that's okay, right? But it's what can we do? And, and let's go back to that for one second. When I say that's okay, I actually mean that's okay. The difference of being saying, well, yeah, like that, that's okay, is are you practicing that to give yourself the space of self-compassion and saying, Catherine, you've got this. It's a really shitty time right now. And there's a lot of overwhelm. What do you need to feel good in your heart, in your body, in your mind, in your soul, right? For me, it's doing this with you. For me, it's moving my body every day. For me, it's doing back, doing the artist way right now. For me, it's journaling. For me, it's doing meditation. I'm doing Deepak Chopra's 21 Days of Abundance right now. It's all these little 
things, these bite-sized pieces that for me culminate my entire practice of self-care and self-love, right? And it's not perfect, guys. Like my I sh- shit hits the fan every single day in my house with homeschooling, but it's finding those gaps. Like I spoke about with Samara a couple of weeks ago about mindfulness, right? The founder of Mindfulness Matters, about finding the gap, the gap between the thought and the reaction, the thought and the reaction, that space, that sacred space of pause, right? And so before you get overwhelmed with the thought that our kids can't go to camp, how can you find that pause and then insert mindfulness, insert what is possible, insert breath, right? Because it's not about optimally, suboptimally. It's about those baby steps, right? Those mini touch points of saying, okay, that was a little different than yesterday. That triggered me hardcore yesterday, but today I paused, right? And it's not a constant tangent in the straight line of success, but it's looking at what can we do a little differently, best attitude, best effort. That's all you can bring, right? And those days that you don't have the best attitude and you can't bring your best effort, find those around that you that can lift you up, right? And find something around you externally that can maybe make you laugh, bring a little joy. But remember that happiness starts within, that it is the internal practice of reminding yourself of your greatness, right? That those practices of discipline and focus will allow you to shine from the inside out and the outside in. It's like this constant interchange of your existence in the world right? And so I just wanted to share that. I don't know if that offers any insight, but my hope is that I can get some people that can speak on this from, you know, a clinical standpoint, from people that know the space of managing grief and managing mourning and pain and stress so that they can give you tangible tools. But to end today, I want to know, how are you managing? How are you doing? You know, one of my greatest moments is when I hear from you guys directly via email, via text, via DM, whatever it is, to know how you're doing and how and if this conversation is making a difference for you, right? I know that it makes a difference for me and those of you that listen week after week, so thank you. And I know that These are unprecedented times, but my conversation and why I keep doing this week after week for you right now and multiple times a week is that this matters. You matter and you're not in this alone. And I am here to champion for you, hold you accountable, cheer you on and remind you that we'll get through this, right? And that you're doing amazing exactly where you are. Just keep going, right? Keep coming back to this conversation. Keep finding inspiration and stick with what you are grateful for in these moments. Be present to that. And if you need a reminder, there were some great exercises that Samara gave us through um, Mindfulness Matters. There were some great exercises that Michelle Jacobs gave us, some great exercises, breath work from Tracy Sagrati. Go back to these podcasts over the last six weeks because they are some really tangible tools that you can get into right now. Stay tuned later this week as I interview Randy. It was a great conversation. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. Bye for now.